There's no denying that the 1977 Doctor Who serial The Talons of Wang Chiang borrows heavily from fiction, from the costumes and mystery of a Sherlock Holmes adventure to the villainy and aesthetics of Fu Manchu. But there's a darker influence that permeates this family TV serial, a genre of ghoulish storytelling about real life which has resulted in a character whose presence in fiction creates ripples of taboo excitement. And whilst undoubtedly the story owes a lot to Phantom of the Opera, there were actually real-life events that predated the novel that concerned grisly findings in tunnels beneath a forgotten music venue. So let us walk the streets of the genuine Victorian London of 1888 and explore their subterranean levels to discover how this Tea Time Adventure series connects to the harrowing reality of Whitechapel during the Autumn of Terror and the figure who tormented it. It says in the paper how it could be Jolly Jack at work again. Jolly Jack? The rip by Mr. Jekyll. One hundred and thirty-five years of fanciful films and television shows have shaped a semi-mythical figure out of a dysfunctional, violent, middle-aged man. A man whose real name remains unknown, despite the endless stream of books tapping into the lucrative true crime market. Doctor Who is supposed to be a family adventure with a mysterious twist, just like the stories of Sherlock Holmes, and yet, with the talons of Wang Chiang, there is immediately an uncomfortable reality that pervades the opening moments. There is a sobriety to the scene in which a cab driver anxiously looks for his missing wife, Mrs. Buller, because we are sinking into a world which experienced true horrors never touched upon during the detective stories from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Despite all the evil and death encountered by Sherlock Holmes, he never faced the brutality and psychopathic hate of a serial killer and yet this is what seems to await our Time Lord hero. Of course, Doctor Who is not really serving up that culprit. There is nothing mindless or even violent about the deaths of the poor women in this story. The villains have their own scientific, if grisly, motives. And yet, by invoking the tabloid nickname of a real-life murderer, the characters in the Talons of Wang Chiang leave us in no doubt as to the kind of world we are stepping into and the fear we should anticipate on the streets of London. In the autumn of 1888, a series of murders began in Whitechapel. Jack the Ripper unquestionably killed three, almost certainly four, and most experts agree upon five innocent women. Some will argue six, and very quickly in Talons, the idea of a grim tally is exploited to heighten the suspense, and it ups the ante with this poster which echoes the real Whitechapel headlines, but stating eight missing girls. This tells the audience that the situation is, in fact, worse than the threat of Jack the Ripper. The Talons of Wang Chiang's most obvious reference to these awful murders is in the profile of the victims that are targeted by the villainous Greel and his lieutenant Chang. In the Whitechapel crimes, the victims were all female and some, if not all, worked as prostitutes. At least three were actually seen being propositioned in the minutes before their death. Biologically speaking, it seems unlikely that there was any scientific reason that Greel's awful machine wouldn't have worked on a man but in order to fit the template of the Whitechapel genre, Greel preyed on women. But more than that, he says they won't be missed because they are contemptible slattens. In its literal meaning, this somewhat arcane word meant someone careless and sloppy in their habits. However, in reality, it was a slang reference to promiscuity. In fact, slattern is where we get the term slut. Even today, someone from an older generation might still refer to someone as slutty and mean they are untidy 
but a younger person would infer quite a different meaning. For the avoidance of doubt, writer Robert Holmes notes in his script that this victim is indeed a lady of the night. And thus, couched in slightly obscure language, the family adventure serial Doctor Who has ventured into the world of sex workers, in addition to the overt drug references and violent crime. But it's not just the type of young woman which is notable in Talons, but the manner in which they meet their demise. In this one scene in particular, Chang wears a costume very typical of the cliched Jack the Ripper silhouette of folklore. His approach to this unsuspecting woman is extremely evocative of a typical situation in which the real Whitechapel killer engaged his victims. A situation made possible by their trade, which required them to engage with a stranger and accompany them to a secluded place. But for all its haunting similarity to real life, there is one particular way in which this scene is inspired by fiction instead of fact. The murderer's costume is not accurate. Because despite all the myths and theatrics around the Whitechapel case and all the unknowns, we do know what Jack the Ripper looked like, and it was nothing like this well-dressed gentleman. During the Whitechapel crimes, several witnesses saw different victims with a man in the minutes leading up to their deaths. The relevance of some of these sightings is debatable, but there's one in particular which is inarguably the victim's final customer, and also the witness got an extremely good look. A few short minutes before Catherine Eddowes was found dead in Mitre Square, three witnesses passed her and a man talking, and one witness from only nine or ten feet away gave a good description. Jack the Ripper was revealed to be an ordinary looking, rather rough and shabby, 30-year-old man with a height of five foot seven or eight, a fair complexion with a fair moustache. He had a medium build, he was dressed in a pepper and salt colour loose jacket, wore a grey cloth peaked cap and a reddish handkerchief tied in a knot around his neck. There is a curious coincidental overlap here between Doctor Who, Sherlock Holmes and the real Whitechapel killer. In this serial, the Doctor is wearing a deerstalker hat as a tribute to Sherlock Holmes's most famous costume. A look that was first seen in the illustrations for the Boscombe Valley Mystery in 1891. But this was not a quirky or out of place item of clothing for Holmes to be wearing, as revealed by how often it's mentioned in the inquest testimonies during the Whitechapel murders. Take for example a man called George Lusk, he set up a vigilance committee to try to catch the Ripper, and he was the recipient of the famous letter from hell. He had a prowler around his house whose description included a deerstalker. Another example was one of the many murder suspects nicknamed Leather Apron, and when he was last seen by his associates was said to be wearing a deerstalker. But the most significant mentions are on the nights that three of the victims were killed. During Annie Chapman's final minutes, she was seen with a man who wore a deerstalker hat. One Constable Smith saw Elizabeth Stride talking to a man in a deerstalker shortly before her demise. This suspect, like the one seen with Catherine Eddowes, was five foot seven, and he carried a parcel wrapped in newspaper. And regarding that occasion where Eddowes was cited by three witnesses, one of them told the police commissioner that the cap that had been mentioned had a peak front and rear, and specified it was a deerstalker. So although the doctor is wearing this hat as a nod to another fictional hero, ironically he may have inadvertently been copying the villain of the piece. The unsettlingly ordinary sounding middle-aged man with his grey coat, peaked cap and red neckerchief is a far cry from the mythical figure with top hat and cane. A figure in a top hat is not part of the real Whitechapel events, although the ex-partner of the final victim Mary Kelly, whose name was Joseph Barnett, cut a very respectable figure when giving his evidence. Barnett was described as well-groomed with a neatly trimmed moustache, top hat, coat and cravat. So where did this elegant upper-class portrayal of the Ripper come from? 
Some pathologists who summarized the injuries suggested that the murderer had some rough anatomical knowledge, meaning that he simply knew the approximate layout of the organs of the human body, which wouldn't have been known to all the uneducated masses. But this wrongly seeded the idea that the killer was a medical man. This assumption was bolstered by the sighting of a man with a Gladstone bag on the night of Elizabeth Stride's murder, although he was later identified as one Leon Goldstein. But it was after the death of the final woman, Mary Jane Kelly, that a particular newspaper report really solidified the modern myth. A woman called Mrs. Pormier told a reporter that on the 9th of November there had been a suspicious man accosting women and making unsettling remarks. She said the man had a black moustache and was about 5 foot 6 inches in height. He wore a black silk hat, a black coat and speckled trousers. He also carried a shiny black bag about a foot in depth and a foot and a half in length. When asked what he had in the bag, he replied, Something that the ladies don't like. Interest in Jack the Ripper waned in the early to mid 20th century until film and television seized upon him as an ideal villain. Particularly during the 1950s, the idea resurged that the Ripper had been a doctor, and this was depicted on screen, such as in an episode of the American anthology series The Veil. And then more significantly in the 1959 film Jack the Ripper, which importantly gave the killer a top hat, cape and bag. In the decade or so before Robert Holmes sat down to write The Talents of Wang Chiang, there were several other major screen appearances of Jack the Ripper which would have influenced him, the director and the costume and design departments. In 1965, a study in terror was made which blended many of the ingredients that would be seen a decade later in Doctor Who. In this film, Sherlock Holmes was pitted against Jack the Ripper, and although this wasn't the first time it happened in fiction, it was the first time it was seen on screen in colour with both detective and murderer dressed in their most famous costumes, just as they would be in the talents of Wang Chiang. This film had additional links to the expanded Doctor Who universe, as these are the very same sets that would be invaded by the Daleks filmed less than a year later. Both productions were made at Shepperton Studios, and the street scenes were filmed on the same backlot. On New Year's Day in 1975, BBC One showed the Star Trek episode Wolf in the Fold, which took Captain Kirk to an alien planet which just so happened to look like Victorian London, complete with fog. And in this setting, the crew of the Enterprise encounter the immortal alien spirit, which turned out to be Jack the Ripper. Then on the 13th of July 1975, BBC Two's midnight movie was Jack the Ripper, and this was the 1959 production that depicted the murderer with his top hat, and prominently featured a bag from which he produced his murder weapon. This production also included a music hall scene and the performance of a polka. Just over a year later, Robert Holmes discovered that he would have to write an emergency script for Doctor Who, and all this imagery was swirling in his mind. In his script, he not only had Chang wearing the classic Ripper costume, but the storyline also includes a bag which contains the key that becomes integral to the story. We also have a music hall setting and the performance of a polka that sounds very reminiscent of that heard in the 1959 film. For the title of his Victorian crime horror, Holmes chose to evoke the bloody hallmark of Jack the Ripper. We might speculate that the starting point of his naming process was Greel the Ripper, giving rise to the immortal line about the villain's talons shredding a woman's flesh, before settling on a more obtuse reference to the sharp weapon causing the mutilations, resulting in the talons of Greel. In essence, this was the equivalent to calling the serial The Knife of Jack. And finally, the title was tweaked again before broadcast not just to heighten the connection to Fu Manchu, but because Wang Chiang is itself a pseudonym, just as Jack the Ripper is. When Robert Holmes came to populate his serial with interesting foils for the Doctor and Leela, he chose two figures of authority who embodied the narrative of the real-life Ripper case in significant ways. <laughs> 
we are introduced to the key facts of the mystery by the Doctor's meeting with Professor Lightfoot at the mortuary. During the Whitechapel atrocities, all the gruesome details which have so famously characterized the murders originate from the pathology reports, which were given in full at the inquests. Attempting to find clues during the formal assessment of the victim's wounds in a medical setting is absolutely a characteristic of the Whitechapel murders in contrast to the ad hoc methods of Sherlock Holmes. For a series of crime stories, the Sherlock Holmes adventures are surprisingly devoid of police interactions. The famous detective does work with a handful of different inspectors from Scotland Yard, with the most famous being Lestrade, but he barely encounters any bobbies. In fact, out of the 60 works by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, only about a dozen constables and sergeants are mentioned by name. In contrast, thanks to the witness statements at the inquests, the events of the Whitechapel horror are often told through the eyes of the policemen, some of whom discovered the poor victims, and others provided vital statements about the timeline of events. Plus, they conducted inquiries and scoured the streets for the suspect. One of the most involved officers in the Ripper case was the unfortunately named Sergeant William Thick, who earned the nickname Johnny Upright. He viewed the victim Annie Chapman in the mortuary, and he visited the common lodging houses in Hanbury Street where she was killed. He also arrested the local suspect nicknamed Leather Apron, the one who wore the deerstalker. Thick was also present at the awful crime scene of the Ripper's final victim, Mary Jane Kelly. When Robert Holmes came to write The Talons of Wang Chiang, he included a solid, sterling officer, but as Jago observed, his buttons may have been the brightest thing about him. The real-life constable who failed to detect Jack the Ripper was almost too perfectly named as P.C. Thick, but Robert Holmes would never resort to picking such low-hanging fruit, so with tongue-in-cheek, he names his officer P.C. Quick. This isn't the only minor character in Talons whose name is borrowed from the Ripper files. If you recall the snappily dressed boyfriend of the final victim, at the time of her death, he was staying with none other than Mrs. Buller, the name of the missing wife of that frantic cab driver. Robert Holmes has therefore taken the name of one of the final characters in the Ripper saga and used it to begin his own new mystery in the Doctor Who universe. The crimes of Jack the Ripper were notorious for several reasons, including their audacity, but the grim hallmark is, of course, as captured by the nickname, the mutilations of the victims' bodies after they died. But since Greel's method leaves no injury, the gory component of the crime scenes is absent. So, to compensate, Robert Holmes does something clever with a secondary plot strand. The writer introduces gigantic rats into the equation, inspired by the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. With the giant rat of Sumatra, the story for which the world is not yet prepared. These animals will gnaw at any poor souls who stray into their path, which therefore provides an opportunity to have a body discovered with horrifying injuries. And this can be described in beautifully evocative style. Oh, my God, oh, sick, that word, oh. Therefore, where Talons misses out revealing the fates of the girls, it gets to have its cake and eat it in terms of gore. But the body found floating in the river has a far stronger connection to the Autumn of Terror than simply as a plot device. Because whilst Jack the Ripper rose to fame, there was a second killer at large in London at this time, one with a totally different modus operandi which has left him relegated to the sidelines of history's rogues gallery. In the years before Jack the Ripper became infamous, a different killer operated in London. And significantly, his disposal of the victims, piecemeal in parcels dropped in or around the Thames, made them very difficult crimes to solve. This individual became known as the Thames Embankment Killer, but only some of his crimes became prominent and that was thanks to the concurrent Ripper murders. On one of the occasions when the embankment killer strayed away from the Thames to dispose of his victim, a series of remains was distributed around Tottenham Court Road during 1884. 
and this included part left in Bedford Square Gardens, a stone's throw from that infamous Doctor Who haunt, the Fitzroy Tavern. But the incident most relevant to the talons of Wang Chiang was yet to come. Two days after Jack the Ripper killed Annie Chapman, on the 11th of September 1888, a porter called Frederick Moore was standing outside Grosvenor Road station when he spotted an object lying in the mud of the River Thames. He climbed down the ladder and approached the object, which he realized was a human arm, and he fished it out of the river. This is all extremely similar to the scene in Talons when Mr. Buller's body is recovered at Wapping Old Stairs. Then three weeks later, and just a day after Jack the Ripper apparently killed two women in one night, another piece of the same Thames victim was found, and this time it ties in in an extremely surprising way to Doctor Who. In the talons of Wang Chiang, Magnus Greel's base of operations is beneath the Palace Theatre. This underground layer connects to the sewers, giving him a handy way of disposing of his victims and an escape route, albeit a risky one. In 1875, on a site just north of the Palace of Westminster, an impresario named James Henry Mapleson chose this site as the location of the new Grand Opera House. It was intended to be the jewel in the crown of the Thames Embankment. By the end of 1875, the major groundwork had been completed, including secret passages to the Houses of Parliament so that MPs could sneak in for performances. But the money started to run out. In 1881, the scheme was abandoned. Eventually, it was sold for redevelopment, and everything above ground was demolished, except for the Opera House's underground vaults and tunnels. In 1887, the site was given over to house the new Metropolitan Police Headquarters, and the extensive subterranean opera level was incorporated into the new plans. At the weekend at the end of September 1888, the Thames Embankment killer managed to carry the torso of one of his victims through a network of 50 yards of partly underground passages to the remote corner of the building that was once the lower levels of the unfinished Grand Opera House. The similarities to the basement of the Palace Theatre, along with its morbid goings-on, are quite striking. It was a Dr. Charles Hibbert who confirmed that the previously discovered arm was part of the same victim found in the Opera House basement. The mortuary scene was depicted in the newspaper like this. It feels less than somber, and the victim is improbably shapely. There is an almost comical sense to the process of realizing the body parts are a match. It seems quite believable that Robert Holmes saw this sketch and was inspired to create the scene in which we meet the jovial pragmatist Professor Lightfoot, who glibly summarizes the unpleasant end met by his latest patient. Because of the music hall setting, Talons is often rightly said to borrow from Phantom of the Opera, and the echoes are clearly there with the masked figure darting around the theatre location. It's therefore tempting and probably quite right to assume that Jago's idea to name the place the Lair of the Phantom and give guided tours makes this reference even clearer. But in fact, the spectre of Magnus Greel and the language used here also owe something to the Whitechapel Terror. Because the Ripper's ability to vanish into the night like a spirit was very much what shaped the legend. In addition to the level of brutality, the apparent ease with which he evaded justice led to a sense that this killer was a superhuman spectre. This sentiment was reflected in a newspaper report of October 1888, which asserted, the events of the last few weeks are more characteristic of phantoms and vampires than of human beings. 12,000 armed and educated constables are helpless the phantom, vampire, or ghost comes and disappears, not seen and not heard by anybody except his victim. A satirical cartoon in Punch during the height of the Whitechapel murders personifies crime itself in the form of Jack the Ripper, and it refers to the threat saying, there floats a phantom on the slum's foul air. And this depiction is a critical aspect of the Autumn of Terror, 
because there are two quite separate entities involved in this case. One is the actual Whitechapel murderer, who was a middle-aged man who lived an otherwise mundane life in a nearby house, and the other is the legendary Jack the Ripper. The tabloid journalist's dream of a nameless demonic slayer with almost magical powers given his own dramatic pseudonym and impressive costume. In the writing of the Talons of Wen Chiang, Robert Holmes actually manifests this duality by having both versions present of the Whitechapel menace. In Chang, we see the middle-aged man, in his own words, a humble peasant. He is the mundane reality of murder, the one actually responsible for the disappearances, who is a pathetic individual and ultimately regrets his choices. But we also meet the myth, the faceless evil phantom from another realm, who hides behind a pseudonym and wears an impressive costume. But unlike Jack the Ripper, we see this villain unmasked, literally and figuratively. We discover his true name, declared proudly as Magnus Greel, which is meaningless to us, the audience. And despite the hundreds of suspects put forward by as many books, the real Whitechapel murderer's name most likely has never been discovered. An unassuming local resident who blended into the background and whose real name would fittingly be as meaningless to us when revealed as if it was determined to be Magnus Greel. There is never a suggestion that the disappearances caused by Chang and Greel explain the unsolved murders of 1888 and the two types of crime are not similar, but in constructing his fictional world around a genuine series of murders, Robert Holmes has connected it to the real world in a most unsettling way and reminded us that there are true evils that stalk the streets, more terrifying than the futuristic villain we actually see unmasked. <laughs>